My name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye, and this is episode 12. It's going very well. Now, first of all, I need to start off and say a huge, huge thank you to all of you. Because in episode 11, if you haven't watched it yet, here's the link, click up here. Yeah, go watch it. I asked you the first question of the day from my side. So, like I said, I've been asking a lot of questions, well, answering a lot of questions, which, and loving it, absolutely love doing this kind of stuff. Now, the reason that it's a real deep, honest thank you from my side is I asked you guys, where in the world are you watching this from? And the response is just phenomenal. I actually have to do this. Um, stand by one. I'm going to pull up my Instagram quickly here. And on the question, I'm going to post, if you're on Instagram, go and look for this image on my feed. I'll drop it in here now. Um, just, to, just to give you an idea, this blew my mind. I mean, where are you watching the show from? Or the ep show, the episode, it's a show, yeah? Alberta, Canada, Mumbai, India, let's keep going. Uh, Florida, USA, USA, Sweden, sunny South Africa, yes please. Um, Malalani, South Africa, Tura Firun, Khalakhari. Someone's actually sitting in one of our most beautiful parks watching this, that's so awesome. Atlanta, Georgia, Dubai, Emirates, Josie, I've got Canary Island, Spain, Canterbury, New York, Jersey, um, New York, Jersey, USA. I've got West Sussex, Harare, Zimbabwe, England, Netherlands, Kenya, Germany, Hungary, Iran, Tehran, Republic of Stellenbosch, yes, Janine. South Africa, Sweden, New Zealand, Australia. It goes on and on and on. Guys, thank you so much. It is incredible to know that me talking to this camera every single day goes out to you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you for following, and let's keep on doing it. Enough of that, let's get on with it. Anant asked on Instagram, bro, can you also explain the shooting of birds in flight and animals in action? Anant, good question, but not enough. I need more from you. If you say to me, explain birds in action or birds in flight and animals in action photography, I don't know what you want to do. Um, a lot of photographers, when they start growing with the craft, they don't dig deep enough. They don't. They look superficial and say, how do I capture an, a bird in flight? Like, I'm not saying this is you, but for us to take this further, you need to tell me, what do you want? What do you want? Um, is do you want to freeze a kingfisher diving into the water or do you want to create a motion blur of, uh, I don't know, of a, uh, pick one, black-chested snake eagle hovering where the wings are blurred and the body is still. So the question is answered by another question is what do you want? What is the type of image that you want to create? And the same thing goes for animals in action. Do you want to get the zebra running across? Do you want to freeze him in action equals fast shutter speed? Do you want to blur him running past? You're going to get a much slower shutter speed and then your technique's different because you have to track very smoothly with that animal. So my question to you, Anand, is what type of images do you want to create? Alyssa asked on Instagram, Jerry, if you could choose one destination, where would you go? Alyssa, thank you so much for this one. It is, again, like with the, the one from last week or last episode where I was asked, how do you get a job in wildlife photography? This is one I get asked quite often and I cannot answer this. My favorite destination. You know what? If you asked me this morning, where do I want to go this morning? You know what? I, I, I was on text message to a friend earlier this morning who works in Medikwe where I spend a lot of time. You asked me right now, I want to go to Medikwe. Um, you hit me up this afternoon, it might be a different answer. I like being out in the field and stacking the odds in my favor wherever I'm at. Now, I think a big problem, and there's a lot of you that do this, is you get so enamored and in love with the area that you're in that you lose your head a bit, yeah? Um, and I also think that people, I mean, Marlon and I were speaking about his trip from to, he just came back, where from Ndutu, yeah? Serengeti. Serengeti. So Marlon's been in the guiding amp for a long time. I've been in the guiding amp for a long time. I'm comfortable going into the bush. A lot of people who are not comfortable going into the bush, this is going to sound wrong, but bear with me here, they, they get so, what is the word, swept up in the emotion of all of it that, oh my God, monopoles is the best, it's going to change your life when you go there. Or, you know what, oh my goodness, the Sabi sand is just the best place in the world, it's heaven on earth and, 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 and I just can't cope. If you go into that mindset, I don't think you are going to get the best images out of that trip. Because you're looking at it through blinkers of, oh my God, this is the most incredible place in the world. You then go to another destination and it's going to, in your mind, photographic mind and just your bush mind, if there's such a thing, you're going to compare them to each other and think, this is nice, but it's not as great as. I think that every single, Pilansburg, for example, not my favorite, 
it's straight up. I mean, I don't like the idea that there's so many cars around. I find it limiting not being able to go off-road, things like this. But you tell me now, listen, we're packing our bags tomorrow morning and we're going there. I'm going to go there and love the experience. I'm going to deal with what I have. There's no point me comparing Pilansburg to Monopools or to Masamara or to Serengeti or wherever. I mean, Svalbard, for example. They all have their own unique characteristics. And for me, I'm lucky enough to get to all these places. I take each one at face value. Um, I must be honest, I don't get enough time to do my own thing and just go off into the bush. If I had that, again, it'll depend. You, if I can get in my car now, I'll drive straight to Medikwe because I've got friends there, I've got an emotional attachment. But my photographs might show that. Be careful of, and especially guys running trips. Um, and I've spoken to some of my guides about this, is you're in this area, don't allow your mind to get lost completely because you need some of it to capture the emotion of the place. Marlon, does it make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, Marlon's been in the bush for us. So, I, I just think, what is my favorite destination? Maybe I can answer this in the same way from a camera point of view. What's the best camera is the one you have with you. For me, what is my favorite destination? The one where I'm at, at that moment. Simple as that. Ian asked on Instagram, what do you class as fine art photography? Uh, Ian, very, very good question. And something I was wondering when someone's going to pick it up on. Now, fine art prints. Okay, your question revolves around what is a fine art print? Because I've been saying, kind of sneaking them in every once in a while, that a lot of people out in the wildlife photography game now are converting to black and white and saying, buy my fine art prints. It's bullshit. It doesn't work that way. Right. Yes, you're going to sell one or two. Your grandma's going to buy one, whatever. I don't see that as fine art. Why? I think, look, each to his own. But for you to create a piece of art, there needs to be, I think, there needs to be a couple of things. It needs to start with an idea. The artist needs to have an idea of what they want to do. They want to print, I mean, and I'm, I'm going to use Marlon now, I mean, he, he's sitting right across there. He creates amazing images, but I know he starts this before he starts processing an image. He knows where he wants to get to. There's a vision of sorts, yes? So he goes out and he creates a piece of art with intent. I think too many people out there simply go sit in front of their Lightroom, Photoshop, Picasso, whatever they're using, do a very quick conversion on random images in there, and you can see it in their Lightroom. They do random conversions and think, ooh, this one looks nice in black and white. Let me call it a fine art print. Now, maybe, maybe I'm going too deep and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I strongly, strong and truly believe this, that if you as the artist go in with intent and you set out to create art rather than just kind of a spray and pray approach in your Lightroom, that the authentic nature thereof and your belief in your own vision and intent will create something that stands out above. Bottom line, I think, is if someone's wanting to put your print up on their wall, it's art. Yeah, I just find, and look, here's the thing, I've got no, I haven't got one single of my own images on my wall at home. Marlon, do you have your own images on your wall at home? Still working at it. Still working at it. I've been working at it for, I think, about 10 years now, and I still haven't got any of my own images on my own wall. I don't want to put an image of a lion on my wall. That to me is not fine art. That's a nature, a natural documentary, natural history documentary type shot, yeah? At a lodge, at that kind of environment, yeah, it works. For me, no, I need something that the piece of art I'm looking at personally needs to be a suggestion at the full story. I need my mind to complete it. I wanna look at that image for a long time and not just think, ooh, it's a lion. I wanna look at that image, sit back and let it take me somewhere. This is all very kind of in the cloud stuff, hey, Ian? I don't know if this is helping. But I think if you want to create fine art prints and the authentic nature of it will come through eventually is go out with a vision. Before you sit down, you take an image and you know instantly that is what I'm going to do with it. Process that vision, follow your intention, and that authentic nature will speak to people eventually. Anybody can sell a print, yeah? I could probably put a print up now and have it sold up by this evening. Yeah. But is it sustainable? The idea of selling a fine art print, ooh, because everybody's now. Nah, I don't think so. You need to keep it real and authentic. That to me. I mean, Ian, drop me a mail. Uh, where was this? This was with Instagram, yeah? Um, that's my thoughts. I just think suddenly everybody's on the bandwagon of fine art prints, fine art prints, wildlife fine art prints. It's a black and white lion. 
Simple as that. So I would, yeah, keep it authentic, follow your vision, and do it with intent. That'll keep it authentic. Okay, Ian, here's the deal. Um, after answering that previous question, Marlon and I had a discussion. He's working very hard over there, so he can't join in. But also, I mean, the idea of, this is just from the discussion we had, is a lot of people out there, they, they put out a print for what, like 250 rand? Other people want to put that same print out there for 2,500 US. Big difference. It's what do you want? It's, first of all, you as the artist have to define for yourself what it is. And this comes back to the social media world of, I can make a piece of, I can take a picture of this tin, yes? Put it in black and white, put it on a canvas. If I believe it's art, that's really where it stops because me as the artist has, I've, I've defined it for myself. Whether one person buys it, nobody buys it, or two million people buy it, that's for them to decide. But, but Marlon, yes, you have to, as the artist, you have to decide. This is kind of from Marlon and my discussion. You have to define for yourself what that fine art is. Yeah? Okay, I'm gonna pull Marlon in here for a moment because he's, he's like chomping at the bits to get in here. Have a seat. How's it, guys? Yeah, so um, just after this discussion, it's just something that, um, that I, I'm also confused by, the same as you guys. You know, what is fine art? And I think it's been, it's been over commercialized in a sense, it's been over perverted. There's, there's so many things out at the moment. You know, a guy like, like Peter Lick selling a photograph for, what's it, $6 million or something like that, um, labeled a fine art print, and so a lot of questions up about that. But there's also people, the majority of people saying they're successful um, photographer or in terms of fine art and selling their prints because they do it, like Jerry said, for like 15 or $20 an image. And to me, that's, that's not, it's, it, it doesn't equate to successful. You know, I can put up photos right now and, and like Jerry said, put up 10 photos, sell all 10 in an hour at 250 rand a photograph, no problem. But is that, do you do yourself justice? Do you do fellow photographers justice? Okay, question for you. Mm. How do you define fine art, you as the photographer? For me, like for, for my work, so if I put up an image to sell or if somebody says I would like to buy a, a black and white photograph for my home, um, to me it's, so for me, if I had to put something on my wall, it would mean a lot more than just hitting black and white on my, in my Lightroom or, or Photoshop and converting that image. I'd, I'd put a lot of thought into my images. So um, as for Im somebody um, wanting to buy something from me, if they say they want a leopard, I won't just say, okay, cool, I've got a cool leopard for you. He has this image. You want to find out what it is about that leopard, what it is about that image that, that will make people stop, will make yeah, people look, will, yeah, will, will, will draw somebody's eyes, not just um, a, a photograph of a leopard. It's something that, that takes a lot of emotion. Um, it's an image that's got to tell a story. It's an image that's got to mean something. Um, not just any, so many photographers will go and put up a photograph in black and white because it doesn't look good in color. So they'll just go up and, and convert, you know, yes, you know, the light wasn't that, let me, let me do black and white, let me make this, oh, that looks great. And that is, that's ridiculous, it doesn't work like that. Black and white photography and fine art photography for me is, it's, there's very certain things that work or doesn't work. And it's got to be emotive. There's got to be a huge amount of emotion and mood and even more so than in a color image. Color has color, great light, is already sells that image and that story. But in black and white, you're extracting everything. So, um, you know, you have to, as a, an artist, work at that image. In terms of processing, there's a whole lot more time that goes into the contrast and the layering and, the, and what you add to that image. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm diversing a lot here, but I really feel that there's so much more to fine art photography, first of all, in the image that you select than what I see on social media and on people's websites. The stuff I see there's absolute, most of it is, and if, if you feel offended, then I'm sorry, but, but it is, it's, it's rubbish. It's stuff that I, that I just scroll past, I pay no attention to it. Very seldom it, that I, do I stop and actually pause and look at a, a fine art image and think, Yo, you know, that's, that's beautiful, I would love that on my wall. Hardly ever happens, but when it does, that image usually has a special X factor that, that makes me want to get it, that makes me want to have it. And I think, um, you know, if you sit and really dull through images and think about it, there, there's great stuff that you can find on there. But stop just converting something for black and white because it looks better than what it did in color. That is, is absolute nonsense. And as in terms of value, that's something you've got to find within yourself. Um, but I do believe that if most photographers sell their work for 200 rand, 300 rand, uh, 500 rand, whatever, you know, you just... 
it's, it's easy to do that way. And I'm not saying I feel threatened by people putting their work out at 250 Rand because I set a value to my work. If people buy it, then, you know, great. If they don't, then it's, it's fine. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drop the value of what I feel my work is worth purely because other photographers are underselling themselves. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps. So a little bit of input from my side. <laughs> Keep it real, guys. Okay. So there you have it. You see, vision, intent, and everything Marlon said. Um, yeah, it's, I think the, the next question is going to lead into this as well. I just had a quick quiz of what it is. So um, I was about to ask the question of the day, what do you think it is? But we'll get there to a later stage. Thanks, Marlon. No, Chris okay. asked on Instagram, do you still have trouble distinguishing a great shot from a shot that maybe isn't so, but you have a strong connection to it because of the story behind it? Okay, Chris. Um, this is an interesting one because I've had this discussion with a lot of people on safari specifically where we've been out in the field all day. You come back to, safari, uh, to, to the lodge, whatever, the camp, and you download your images, and then if there's time, you start going through them. Now, I don't process my own images on a safari, and I don't suggest any of my people do either, but... It is nice to work through them and mark them for edits, to get rid of the junk and to start isolating the ones that you want to process. Now, I think one of the biggest skills that people fail to pay attention to is the ability to choose the right shot. Now, you've been out in the field, you know your tech, yeah? Aperture ISO, you got that down like nothing. You're a wizard composition, you can capture the moment, you can do all of those things. But now, you put these things into Lightroom, you have how many? two, three hundred images of a sighting. It must have been a kick-ass sighting. But to then go and choose the single one that speaks to you, a lot of people struggle with this. I mean, I had a, on Big Cats and Tuskers, for those of you that joined me there in Kenya, I had a thing with Penny one day in the media tent, and it became quite a thing because she showed me an image that she said, this is great. And we looked around for a couple of shots before and after, and there were better ones because... People tend to choose, when you look at your images on Lightroom, you tend to choose the predictable ones. You tend to pick, and unfortunately, I think it's a, it's a byproduct of the era we live in where social media is starting to dictate what we put out there. If you, I mean, it's easy. If you want to get likes on social media, put a cat out, put a leopard out, put a lion out, yawning, whatever. You'll get the likes. If you're going for that, good luck. This is probably not the episode for you to watch, but... Don't go for the predictable shots. Go for the good shots. Now, what I do from, from looking through an image point of view, I would sit with my Lightroom, earphones on, whiskey, coffee, whatever time of day it is, <laughs> and I would then literally... Huh? Yeah, Marlon. And, um, and I would literally go full screen, and I would click through one by one, literally at that kind of tempo, yeah? If an image speaks to me, it'll do so immediately. I'm yet, no, not yet to find. It's very seldom that I would look at an image off the bat and think, eh, it's okay. And then you keep staring at it for half an hour and suddenly it makes sense. No. Um, I think if an image is going to speak to you off the bat, it's going to speak to you immediately. That then, if you can identify what it is that it is about that image that speaks to you, that is what you go after from a vision and intent point of view during your processing. So, do I still have trouble with it? I've got, uh, and you mentioned a strong connection. If a sighting is great, yes, there is a strong connection to it, and you will be drawn to those images, but that's why I don't like to do it in the field. Because often, we overlook the good images in the field because, or you, or you look at the bad images, and you've emotionally connected yourself because it was an amazing sighting, an amazing experience. But the images might not be that great. That's why when I get home, I take two or three weeks, and then I start looking at the images because then I'm judging them on face value photographically, not emotionally. So, personally, I found, I'm finding it easier and easier the more I do this to pick my shots. But for you guys, I would suggest don't, don't do them immediately. Don't shoot and immediately go and look for the shots. Let them simmer. Let them kind of bubble for a while and then judge your images photographically, not emotionally. Quentin on email. How much editing is allowed when submitting for competitions? The reason I ask is not that I have any images to submit yet, but rather creating good habits that falls within the spectrum. Quinton, awesome one. Um, I was going to include this in the next episode, which is Lightroom-based. Um, there's a lot of stuff for Lightroom. You know, on this, quickly, let's jump in here. If you haven't yet, the next episode is based on Lightroom. I'm going to do a whole bunch of very short tutorials. If you have questions, here's my email address. I'll put it in here again. Bye. 
and give me an email with the subject, Jerry, please answer my question. Inside that email, send me the image or ask your Lightroom questions. There's a whole bunch lined up, but if you have something interesting, I might just throw it in there as well for the next episode. So, Quinton, I was thinking of adding this particular image, uh, the, this question to that episode, but it does end it off quite nicely for this week, or for this week, for this episode, because um, what is allowed in competition? Do you see... This last year's Wildlife Photographer of the Year threw things up a bit because there are images in there which have been double exposed. There's drones and all kinds of things. Now, from an editing point of view, my approach is this. Look, and look, every competition has its own rules. Yeah, There's don't do this. You can do HDR. You cannot do HDR. You cannot take a picture of this animal, wait, and then blend the background or whatever. They've got their rules, so go after that. If you want to simplify it for yourself as this, and this is the approach... And what I, what I liked in your question, you said you kind of, you haven't ended yet, but you're working on getting into a good habit. I like that because my approach with editing is this. Anything that changes the content of the frame, wrong. I.e., if you go and clone out a branch that's hanging through the frame, if you take away a tick or a whatever, an insect off the lion's face because it ruins your portrait, the moment you change content, the moment you click that, that shutter, whatever is not in that raw file at the time, if you put anything in or you remove anything, and this goes for cloning out branches and leaves in front of the leopard as well, if you change the content of the frame, I think you're walking on thin ice. It's the best I can give you. So in Lightroom, global adjustments, your basic uh, tone curve, HSL, all of the basic um, panels in Lightroom is global adjustments. That's perfect. The moment you start going to brushes, to quick removal tools, the moment you start doing localized adjustments in your frame, be aware of it. Not, not, you're not breaking any rules, but the moment you change content in the frame, you add something that wasn't there, or you take something away that was, I think you've gone too far. But check the rules of the competition, of course. Right, that's it guys, episode 12. It's Monday today, this should be up later today. All going well. Um, nice and busy at the office. I've got to get back to work. Lots on the go. Hustle. Keep moving. Um, yeah. Keep sending me those questions. Drop me the email for Lightroom. And I'll t if you have a good question, go deeper. Don't just say, what does this slider do? Why do you want to know? And then we'll look at that. Mm, that Lightroom episode should be up on Wednesday. And then the week ends on Friday with more questions. Anything on wildlife photography or the wild eye team, give us a shout. Um, the one question came up from last week is, what's in the tank? Go and watch episode 11, you'll see what I mean. And send them through, and we'll keep on answering them for you. As simple as that. You guys have a great week. Get in touch on social, and we'll keep answering those questions for you. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. I will see you next week.